So in my career, the only time I've really been objectively evaluated, I was literally asked to play the board game Operation and remove some plastic pieces without buzzing, which I did. Uh, I'm super excited about, but you know, it's, we're, we're flying a little bit blind right now. So those are the kinds of problems that I was seeing, and it's, it's backed up by the data. You know, at the time that you know, I was thinking about starting Oso, around 30% of graduating residents couldn't operate without needing supervision. And, Clock in, scrub up, and join us behind the red line. You're listening to First Case, a perioperative podcast bringing you exciting interviews, engaging discussions, and innovative solutions that are changing the way patients receive surgical care. Each episode, we talk to frontline staff, perioperative leadership, and nursing entrepreneurs from across the country as they share their stories, experience, and expertise on the industry we love. From the back table to the boardroom, from wheels in to wheels out, we tackle the real-life issues affecting the OR. Whether you're tuning in for surgical service education or inspiration, we're glad you're here. And now, it's time to roll back and start the first case. This week on First Case, we speak with Dr. Justin Barad, orthopedic surgeon and founder, CEO of Oso VR and Paul, I can't wait. I'm not going to spoil it, but I can't wait to talk about Justin's background and how it really combines his work as an orthopedic surgeon with being the founder and CEO of Oso VR. And this might be a technology that you thought a few years ago was in the far off distant future, but it's here today. It's being used and it has some tremendously positive implications for how we conduct surgical training and really training of all healthcare professionals in the industry. Well, you know, Justin, at my age, I'm having a hard time with just reality, let alone virtual reality. <laughs> and uh, to me, I, I, I'm, I'm very excited to learn a lot more about this because I, I think that from what I've read, there are ways that this can help to standardize the competency of physicians and so forth as they do procedures in the operating room, I, I think it's a wonderful opportunity and it's certainly the wave of the future. And I'm really looking forward to listening to what Dr. Barad has to say. All right. We're going to be right back with Dr. Justin Barad, orthopedic surgeon and founder, CEO of Oso VR. Hi, I'm Paul Wafer. I'm Melanie Perry. I'm Jeremy Gibson Roar. And I'm Justin Poole. A 17 Studios production. You're listening to First Case. Joining us now is Dr. Justin Barad, orthopedic surgeon and founder CEO of Oso VR. And uh, we joked before we even got started that uh, we had two Justins on the show for the very first time. Um, I want to welcome you, and I'm really excited. We've seen a lot of the videos of what you're doing on LinkedIn, et cetera. But today, we're going to take a little bit of a deeper dive into all of that and also the industry challenges that you're addressing with the technology that you're putting together. So thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thanks for having me on the show, Justin. It's it's an honor to be the first other Justin on the podcast. <laughs> well, I'm sure we have different backgrounds. I'd love to hear about yours. Why don't you talk about your experience as an orthopedic surgeon, but then also, you know, as a founder CEO, you've had, you know, developed obviously another skill set. And I just love to hear how that path kind of how you went down that path over the the course of your career. Yeah, it's a pretty wild story and, you know, was not all planned out, I'll admit. I actually started out my career wanting to be a video game developer. So I've been programming since middle school. I have a game credit with Activision. And I got interested in healthcare when a family member became very ill. And I just started wondering one day, maybe there's a way to use software and technology to help people and not just for entertainment. So that led me to change my major from computer science to biomedical engineering with this very strong desire to create or invent healthcare technology. But I really had no idea how to get started with invention. So I was kind of asking around and seeking advice from some mentors. And one mentor told me something that sticks with me to this day. He said, 
If you want to invent something, you really need to understand the problem you're trying to solve first. And he thought a great way to understand medical problems was to be a doctor. So in retrospect, I think his ad- I took his advice a little too literally and <laughs> ended up going to med school at UCLA. And that's where I did my orthopedic surgery residency, which is really where I experienced this problem firsthand, how we train and assess our healthcare professionals with procedures and surgery, and basically was able to combine my two life passions of video games and healthcare and start Oso VR. It's such a interesting background. I can't imagine there's a whole lot of other people we're going to talk to on this podcast that are going to say to us, yeah, I started out trying to program and create games and then wound up going to, you know, be a surgeon. That is an incredibly unique combination and skill set. So I think a lot of people, when they hear you say that, they're going to be thinking, oh, that's so different. That's so different. But I also wonder how much as, you know, you obviously know both of those kinds of roles very intimately, where were the commonalities? Where did you find that, oh, there's more overlap here than I really expected? Wow, that's a really good question. There are aspects of my sort of prior life of like understanding technology, how to code, the the language and all of that, that clearly have been very helpful. And then, you know, medicine has been incredibly helpful. I think the, you know, business and innovation and and also like professional technology development has been quite humbling. I've learned a lot. I've had to unlearn a lot of habits, but I will say that in terms of, I'll say like hashtag startup life, I think that I was kind of not uniquely prepared, but pretty, pretty well conditioned for what I was signing up for. Like, not ever sleeping, constantly putting out fires, kind of telling people or dealing with bad news, trying to like keep people excited when, you know, someone's like bleeding out on the table or, you know, you're running out of runway. It's like, you gotta be like, Hey, we got this guys. Everything's fine. Ignore the spurt of blood on the ceiling. We're good. I did find that there was a lot that translated over from, from the medical world. And I think something that, you know, I'm, I'm surprised the tech world, it's like watching the Star Wars prequels sometimes, you know, it's just sometimes, you know, certain certain parts of it, the humanity can be sort of sucked out and it's all IQ and very little EQ. And I think, you know, you, you bring a doctor to a table, obviously surgeons are notorious for not having this, but let's just say physicians in general, and just, you know, just someone that cares about other people. It's, you don't find it as commonly as you think. So bringing that to the table was kind of like actually a pretty big positive. You know, it's funny, little known fact about me, but I loved programming computers and I thought I was going to go into computer science and somehow wound up in nursing. But one of the other things that I think translates, at least in my mind, was the way that you think through problem solving and the way that, you know, if this then we have to do this. And you're solving for all of these complex conditions and you have to plan for everything ahead of time, right? If you're making a game, you can't create a pathway that then all of a sudden just stops the game. It has to go and continue to go and, you know, not always on a loop, but it has to follow that pathway. And ultimately you want to have a successful outcome and not have errors, right? And for me, that programming and that world in medical, not just as a surgeon, but you know, anybody who's really working in that healthcare provider role, I always saw that as kind of like a combination. Now, one of the things that led us to talk to you is really what you're doing to help improve training. And so this is where these two worlds collide, right? Is there's a lot of challenges in the industry around training. And yet, you know, if you think about playing a game, a lot of that game is you're training yourself, right? And you're training yourself through those critical pathways. So why don't we talk about the problem you were trying to solve? Your mentor said, you know, but if you're going to be an inventor, you got to figure out what it is that you're trying to solve. So as it relates to surgical training, what were you trying to solve? Well, you know, I'll just start by saying that we're so lucky today to have the the treatments that we do, the healthcare professionals that take care of us that work so hard. I mean, it's nothing short of miraculous. Some of the things I've seen, like the first surgery I ever did was like the Gattaca surgery to lengthen a child's leg so that he could walk. And I, I thought that surgery was science fiction or magic, but it exists. It's amazing. And so I find it's very common in healthcare technology, especially people come in and they're like, hey, 
everything sucks. People are dying all over the place, but you know, put this VR headset on and everything's going to be better. So I, I want to say like, before I jump into kind of the problems, I was saying that, that, you know, healthcare is amazing today. I'm so just in awe of what we have, but in the words of Atul Gawande, better is possible, right? So, you know, how can we keep pushing the limits of, of what's possible? So I think I knew that there were improvement opportunities, let's say, when kind of one of the early cases I was doing, you know, someone was like, hey, you know, Justin, can you run to the computer and, and Google some stuff real quick? We're, we're kind of stuck and don't remember what like slot this needs to go in or et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I'm like, you know, what's going on here? This is like kind of crazy. Like people would be flying from other countries to get care in this hospital. I don't think they expected us to be kind of like, you know, doing some light Googling in the middle of their surgery. I, I really realized that, you know, pandemic excluded, which hopefully poses obvious challenges, which has accelerated all of these things. But there are really like three core things that I noticed. The first is there's simply too much to learn. In a way, we're victims of our own success. Accelerating science and technology has very rapidly expanded the library procedures we as healthcare professionals are expected to know how to do on demand. So uh, I like to say it's like you're going from French laundry to Cheesecake Factory. I mean, Disclaimer, I actually really like Cheesecake Factory, but you just can't do everything well, you know? You know, I always tell this one story. It's like, it's it's a ridiculous story. It's super fun. But one day I was minding my own business when our team was paged to the zoo to operate on a gorilla, which we were completely unprepared for. And we only had like two hours of, I would say, we went from light to heavy Googling on that one. And <laughs> that went great. But I like to say we're dealing with gorilla-like situations every day. These, you know, these procedures, maybe we don't do very often, or maybe we've never done before. Problem two is that modern procedures are a lot more complicated than traditional ones. So newer surgeries that everyone's so excited about, like robotics, navigation, minimally invasive techniques, patient-specific implants, have like a 10 times longer learning curve. So we go from having to practice on 10 to 20, sometimes people, to 50 to 100, you know, and, and ideally you really don't want to be practicing on kind of unsuspecting patients. And then the, the final part of the problem is that we really lack a way to assess technical skill in healthcare. It's not that we don't want to, we don't really have a good way to. So in my career, the only time I've really been objectively evaluated, I was literally asked to play the board game operation and remove some plastic pieces without buzzing, which I did. I'm super excited about, but you know, <laughs> we're, we're flying a little bit blind right now. So those are the kinds of problems that I was seeing. And it's, it's backed up by the data, you know, at the time that, you know, I was thinking about starting Oso, around 30% of graduating residents couldn't operate without needing supervision. And we're seeing that out of the 121 critical cases that residents needed to learn most of them they were doing maybe once or twice. And you're even seeing that some devices were failing clinical trials because people were undertrained. It goes on and on that the rabbit hole is is very deep. It's turtles all the way down. But this problem really affects every aspect of healthcare delivery and all of our quality of lives. It's, it's really, it's wild. And I, I don't think people realize that the potential for improvement in healthcare delivery that Just, this area this is can really, really exciting. impact. Disclaimer is when I started working in the operating room, they didn't have Google or computers, but I did see a few surgeons bringing in manuals with them to try when they were doing a procedure that they were unsure of. But the, the thing you just brought up that really kind of intrigues me is the whole idea of proctoring a new surgeon when they're getting credentialed at a new hospital or what have you. Lots of times I've seen proctors just go in and stay in the room for five minutes and then leave. And the, oh yeah, they're competent, <laughs> no problem. So it's really not a very good process for ensuring the competence of the physician. Having a, a VR to, to help with that process sounds like it would be a really good objective way of making that happen. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't have said it better myself, Paul. And I mean, I won't lie, I had a pretty similar proctoring experience. And I mean, I was ha happy with the outcome for, for me, but that's probably not what we want generally as a system. I think that's that's what this technology has the potential to provide. And I think this is this is really an exploding area of just sort of more insight into the, the, the proficiency and sort of like quality thresholds and standard of care for ourselves and, and others to just to create more consistent outcomes so that if a patient comes into a, a hospital or steps on a plane, it, it's going to be the same result every single time. Like when you get on a plane, 
are you Googling your pilot to see their sort of like health grades reports? Or are you asking your aunt how her experience with that pilot was? You're not. But you do do these things when you get care at a hospital because you know there's a lot of variability. We just inherently know that. And I would love to see a world where that's that's really less of a thing. And I think technology like VR, like OSO, and you know other applications like these remote proctoring video platforms have the opportunity in a fair way to us as physicians, this is physician-led, but to just create a more consistent environment uh, for everybody. So can you break down a little bit further how it works? How does this train surgeons through VR? How, do, how does it teach them what they need to know? Yeah, it's a great question. So our technology utilizes mainstream virtual reality hardware. So we use Oculus Quest 2, which you could literally buy for $300 on Amazon, which is completely wild did. to me. Wild. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My kid's Christmas present this year. Yeah. Well, I've always do <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's cheaper and lighter than a lot of our textbooks. You know, it's, it's kind of crazy to think about. So you put the Quest 2 on your head. You have two controllers in your hands that basically track your hands one-to-one with very fine kind of accuracy and then also provide cutaneous haptic feedback. You select kind of what procedure you'd like to train on. You can kind of view your performance. You jump into the procedure and you can run through and assess your ability to not only do parts of the surgery kind of accurately and well, but also your knowledge of the surgery. So a lot of times, like Paul was talking about, I do this too, is even surgeries I'm pretty comfortable with, I'll just... I'll just tape up on the wall the list of steps of the procedure because just why risk it? You know, like, you know, why not just have that there to, to check? But it's a lot like if any of you guys play an instrument, surgery is very similar to being a musician or, or baking. I'm kind of food obsessed. But, you know, if you're a master piano player, you could throw up some sheet music and you could probably sight read. But if you have it fully memorized, it's you're probably going to be able to perform it better just because you can really focus on just kind of executing the the piece or in this case the procedure and you're not focused on like what's next you don't have to check a piece of paper so that's what our technology does extremely well is it assesses your knowledge of the steps of particular workflows or complications or troubleshooting it assesses your ability to do those things accurately so like you know for orthopedic procedures which we do a lot of we're in a bunch of specialties you know placing pins and screws in the right spot is really important so we tell you how many millimeters off were you how you know, how off was your angle? How deep were you? And then we also time you, you know, so you don't want to go too fast, too slow. You just want to be just the right pace, you know, hit like a goal time. And then you can also train as a team or coach people remotely. So all of us right now could jump in an OSO VR operating room and run through a pre- procedure together. I could kind of go over some tips and tricks from my point of view, go over the anatomy with you guys as well. And then we can view all of that data in performance dashboards and, and track our progress. And so that's what it's like using it. What do the results show? Does it work? That's like the next question we get. And we have several published level one randomized trials that show that this technology, when you use it, increases surgical performance anywhere from 230 to 306% as published in the Journal of Surgical Education and an orthopedic journal called CORE. So it seems to be extremely effective so far in terms of the literature. And, you know, we're continuing, we have a bunch of data under review right now, which is pretty similar order of magnitude. So it's, it's really exciting. You know, you talked about how sometimes you might get called in to do a procedure. You just don't do that that often, right? And something that you mentioned to me, we talked, I want to say several months ago, just as we kind of explored having you come on the podcast. And you talked to me about something about this fallacy around surgeons having this general procedural ability. What is, what does that mean? I, you know, I, I kind of remember you talking about it, but what, what in specific is that referencing? Generally, Our ability, what's called transferability, our ability to apply our skills from one procedure to another is a lot slower than we would like to think. So there was a huge shift in the late 90s of people shifting from what's called a posterior total hip replacement to an anterior hip replacement. So you're basically doing it from the front. It was seen as more minimally invasive and patients really wanted it. So you, you had all of these surgeons that are very highly trained, you know, these are people that do high volume arthroplasty surgery, basically doing the same surgery just from a slightly different approach. So you would think that it it wouldn't be that hard to learn. But we have a lot of data on this now because so many people made this transition. And what they found is that the learning curve, almost regardless of who you look at, 
is somewhere between 50 to 100 cases. So you have to operate on 50 to 100 people in order to kind of just be proficient at this procedure. And these are all fully trained surgeons. These aren't like interns or medical students. And so that's, that's the whole concept. Obviously, there's, there's, you know, there's a bell curve. There are some people who are just incredibly gifted surgeons. And, and typically, it's not only how these people think about procedures, but it's that their fine motor ability is, is like extremely impressive. The vast majority of people are in this sort of like safe kind of like, okay, you're within a couple of standard deviations. And, and then there's a whole other topic of kind of the doctor death kind of situation of there's some people that will just never be able to operate. That, that is to us a slightly separate category. What we're really focused on is, okay, our user base are typically people who can operate. They can do a whole lot of procedures, but they want to, as you say, refresh themselves on procedures they haven't done in a while. So, you know, I remember from my training at one of our pediatric hand surgeons came to me and she's like, Hey, I'm doing like a uh, open femur fracture on like a 200 pound guy. Like I haven't done this in two years. I wish I could refresh real quick. You know, those kind of gorilla situations, as I said before, or, you know, you're trying to a hip replacement surgeon, knee replacement surgeon. You're like, Hey, all my patients are really demanding that I adopt robotic knee replacement. How do I learn how to do this? I know how to do surgery. I'm a highly proficient surgeon, but I need to learn this new technology, this new procedure. And we know the learning curve is, is relatively long for that. So that that's the idea of you have this sort of like innate skill, which are the building blocks or the notes of surgery. And then the pieces of surgery or the recipes are the procedures that we do. And that's really where there is a lot of ongoing challenge for us is staying up to date on procedures and learning new ones. So Justin, then, then how... Do you have relationships with the robotics companies or, you know, the other orthopedic manufacturers of instruments and implants to help them with training new people? What What's that process and relationship like? We do. That's a really important part of our business, and we really value those relationships for those of you listening. I'll describe kind of the challenge from the industry standpoint. So the medical device industry, especially in spaces like orthopedics, is encountering an interesting phenomenon where there's been this commoditization type effect where the products are starting to seem very similar to kind of the end user, the purchasing groups or the surgeons. And they're able to leverage this competitiveness to drive down prices. And so it's been hard for these companies to grow and have the kinds of margins that they used to. However, the introduction of new technologies like navigation, robotics, minimally invasive techniques have created a, a new pathway for rapid growth for these companies. What they did not anticipate is that these technologies are much harder to learn and that the traditional pathway of bringing someone maybe to a hands-on cadaver lab and then having them use the device a few months later is not working as well. And so to give you an example, like let's say you're trying to sell a new minimally invasive device as a learning curve of 50 cases. So surgeon's interested. He's like, hey, I'd like to learn more about it. So you paid for him to come to a, or her to come to a cadaver lab. That could cost anywhere from like five to $15,000. If it's a big course, it could be over $200,000. These are very pricey. And I don't think we realize as healthcare professionals, the amount of time, effort, and money that goes into these things that for our free education, it's amazing. I'm super grateful for this kind of phenomenon. But it goes unsaid is that these companies are expecting us to use these devices on the other end. And a small percentage of people who attend these courses will go on to use the device, but that could be months after the course. So there you are, you're operating on a patient with a device with a learning curve of 50 cases that you used one time three or four months ago in Vegas who knows what you were doing there, right? So that's not going to go particularly well, probably, because you're going to be pretty early in your learning curve. And what happens is the surgeon perceives it that the, the device is unsafe, not that they're undertrained, which is a natural way for us to look at things. And they're like, you know, this this feels unsafe. Like, no matter who we are, where we are, it's always our patients are what matters, and we never want to put them at risk unnecessarily. So we're like, I'm going to stick to what I know. I'm going to stick to what feels safe. And this phenomenon is so common there's an expression for it now. It's called one and done. So the idea behind what we're doing at OsoVR is to accelerate the learning curve so as to overcome this kind of barrier to adoption of what we see as these higher value technologies that are, are better for the healthcare system, are better for patients, and provide more consistent care. And so we can bridge that gap and allow people to train repeatedly, work their way up the learning curve, and 
In some cases, I would say the exception of the rule, we're replacing in-person training, but by and large, we supplement it, but just reposition it along the learning curve where now healthcare professionals are more qualified and more trained and are getting much more out of those trainings. And then they can also refresh themselves in a just-in-time scenario like we were discussing earlier to more consistently create smooth operating experiences for the surgical team and for patients. So I wonder, you're talking a lot about this, creating this technical competence, right? And how much of it is just repetition or are there a lot of other factors that are involved in that? I think certainly spaced repetition is the mother of all learning, but it's taken us quite a while to realize that in healthcare. And I think we're still <laughs> figuring that out. I mean, one of the core tenets of what we do is see one, do one, teach one. I mean, how does that make any sense? You know, and people take that pretty seriously. So it's not rocket science. You know, it's like you're not going to study for an organic chemistry exam and then, you know, take the exam like three months later. Repetition, I think, is a pretty important process, especially with more and more, as you said at the beginning of the talk, a lot of what we do is becoming pretty algorithmic. You, you go down this list of steps. And if, if, you know, if X, if something goes wrong, then you do this list of steps. And it's very similar to how flying a plane is today, where it's, it's, it's really algorithm and checklist based. And that's how we create more consistent outcomes and care. And of course, there is sort of the artisanal craft aspect of what we do. And, and there's some procedures that are way too personalized or we'll never be able to sort of you know, like certain oncology procedures, you're not going to be able to like create an algorithm for that. But certain very high volume procedures like knee replacement, hip replacement, you know, ACL reconstruction, transvascular aortic valve replacement, these are things that we can really kind of create more consistent in the outcomes. And, and that's a lot of the success that we've seen from the utilization of these devices is getting us more consistent in how we do these procedures. So repetition is a part of it. But we also deal with like a lot of variability. So creating sort of rich curriculums with troubleshooting based kind of chapters where you're running through, okay, well, if something goes wrong, then what do I do? And, and what's the checklist in that case? Or like different kind of patient scenarios. You know, this is a patient with dysmorphic anatomy. How do I deal with that sort of situation? So it's, it's a mix of repetition and variability and assessment, but it's really, it's, it's a completely new world for us where in really we're coming into treating patients having only done it once or twice. So this this idea of, of practicing over and over, at, at least outside of actual patient care, is, is relatively novel. So I think this is wonderful and fantastic and so needed. I'm just wondering about acceptance by the physician. You know, you have the different generations of learners, and just based on the electronic health record, we've seen Physicians that are my <laughs> physicians that are my age who the, 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 to retire. The, the turd in the punch bowl yeah. of technology. Yeah. So, how do you get this out into the to the real world, and what's the acceptance like? And is there uh, an age group that's more accepting of this than others? Or yeah, I mean, just to establish my street cred. You know, I almost threw one of my uh, hospital computers out the window once dealing with some EMR stuff. So. <laughs> I definitely that that kind of ruined the party for a lot of people. And uh, I can definitely relate. It's a really good question, I think. And it's not just healthcare professionals. This is a very interesting area where if you talk to any human being, they all have a lot of thoughts around surgical simulation, like you'd be surprised. And a lot of skepticism too, about like, hey, it needs to look this way, even people that are outside of medicine. So I've had a lot of practice getting to talk to this with a large number of people. So I'll say that the first thing is that we are not intending to replace real world hands on training. We are making it much more effective and also providing objective assessment. I think the second you say that, and especially to, to people like surgeons and physicians, and you, you demonstrate that you respect the sanctity of getting our hands on a patient or a cadaver, they immediately trust you much more because they, you know, they know that you realize the limitations of what you're dealing with and, and their day to day life. So I think that's once once we say that people are much more open minded about checking this out and much less skeptical. I'd say I came into this presuming that, OK, this is going to be a technology for kind of what I call the early generation surgeon. Right. These are people who are familiar with video games, with technology they use in their everyday lives. 
And certainly to an extent, that is true, right? This is becoming sort of an expectation of people coming out. They see this technology and they expect that it's going to be there when they're in med school and they're in residency, when they're out in practice. So that's definitely true. And we're seeing more and more of that. What I didn't expect is that the more experienced physician, the more experienced healthcare professional is able to pick the, pick up this technology, be very effective with it, and immediately see its utility. And I'll never forget, we were at the Academy meeting just a few weeks ago in San Diego, you know, the biggest orthopedic meeting of the year. And we had a, a, a pretty experienced surgeon, I'll say, run through, I mean, just crushed this tibial nail and took off the headset. And he looked at me and he goes, I guess you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And I just, I don't know. I love that so much because that to me is just sort of the stereotype smasher. Like technology is not just for young people. It's, it's for everybody. When you, when you solve a problem and you make it usable and accessible, it can really be something that is equitable for all. So you, you fed really right into what I want to know because you talked about being applicable for all. How do you see this technology? We're going further than just surgeons. What about scrub techs or sterile processing professionals or RNFAs? I mean, all of us in the OR have these technical skills that we could augment this way, it seems like. Or why just the OR, right? I think for me, you know, one of the biggest challenges of this technology is that it can do anything. And that becomes its own challenge and that sometimes limitations are helpful and kind of helping guide your growth. So where do we draw the line? I think for me, what Oso VR is, is a technical training and assessment platform for any healthcare professional doing some kind of procedure, technical task in healthcare. So anything where you're using your hands, you're running through a series of steps and doing something 3D spatially, either with or without a patient. So 100% already today, our technology is being used with surgical teams, especially with procedures like robotics. You know, this is something I didn't allude to earlier, but this next generation of procedures is creating another challenge for us. Surgery has always been a team sport. Like there are a lot of people in the room. You guys know this better than anybody, but that role is becoming much more critical and more sophisticated in terms of supporting members of the team. So when you have a surgical robot, take the Da Vinci, for example, you have a surgeon who's at a consult. So he can't address issues with the patient or draping or the robotic arms if they get stuck. So now suddenly the, the surgical tech or the mid-level the NP, the PA have become much more critical to the success of the case. And even non-sterile members like the circulator nurse become extremely critical. For example, an anterior total hip arthroplasty, you're working with a type of surgical table typically called a HANA table. And it became so challenging to the point that if a certain circulator was not present, we would cancel the case because we didn't want to risk it because it was, it was so tricky to coordinate. Even the anesthesiologist is like working a crank sometimes. So it's very important that we provide training to the whole team. And what a lot of people don't realize outside our world is that our team is highly variable, right? Like at UCLA in one month, we were working with 25 different surgical techs for a single surgical team and 51 different anesthesiologists. So, you know, this isn't, it's not always a team you can just train with and you're working with the same group over and over. It's a lot of rotation. So how can you train people kind of on demand as you go and provide a lot more flexibility on the ability to do these cases regardless of who's in the room? So outside of VR, it's very hard for me to imagine a technology that would let you do this quite easily and so scalably because even today, if I were to fly and get trained by a medical device company for a specific device, they're typically not flying my mid-level out. They're not flying my, you know, the 25 techs that I work with. And they're certainly not in servicing all of them. And the best option we have is having a rep in the room who tries to do it with the laser pointer very frantically in like the 30 seconds before the case starts. So very strong yes to your question, Melanie. All right. So uh, we're just about done, Justin. You've done a phenomenal job of really taking something that maybe not everybody would be familiar with and painting a really nice picture, especially with the analogies. You did a really good job, I think, of just getting people to relate to it, people who may not have really done any research on it. It was very easy to relate to these concepts. But what is this concept of immersive surgical training? Because I think you've been kind of describing it, but this is almost like your vision for the future, right? Well, I mean, I don't even know if it's the future anymore. The amount of uh, healthcare professionals we're training on a monthly basis, I mean, it's it's here and it feels like it's here to stay. But certainly it's going to be adopted further as we move forward. And, you know, the idea is just that the vision is that any healthcare professional, you know, whether you're in L.A., New York or Tanzania, Ethiopia, that 
whatever procedure comes your way, you know, whether you have aortic stenosis or you have an open tibia fracture, that you can pop into a headset, you can quickly get you and your team up to speed, you can get objective assessment that you're good to go, and then you can give that patient your very best. I think it's a, an incredibly exciting vision. I think it's a huge leap from the list of steps taped up onto the wall. And so, you know, we live in an amazing world today, but but better is possible. And I think for anyone that hasn't tried this technology, obviously, I think Oso VR is truly amazing. But if you haven't tried modern VR, you really need to because it is pretty wild how fast VR has matured. And, and the Oculus Quest 2 in particular is an unbelievable piece of hardware with some pretty amazing content on there. Yeah, at a reasonable price point. It's not like it's out of the question for anybody to own it. You know, you might have a hard time joining Captain Kirk in space, you know, doing this uh, space tourism. But being able to experience something like, you know, VR is very, very much in everybody's wheelhouse budget wise. And you can almost visualize the same kinds of experiences. You're just doing it in a virtual world. So just an excellent job on this interview. Appreciate you coming on and, and, and sharing your insights. And, and as you said, I think you did it very astutely. Like it's not really paying a picture for the future anymore. That's here. That's what we're doing every single day. Anything you want to add before we close? No, I, I think what you guys are doing are great. I think we are seeing, it's been a interesting couple of years to be sure. And there's just been increased focus on, on healthcare. And I think this awakening amongst people in and around healthcare that we just need to tell our stories and, and talk about what's interesting to us and drive the conversation a little bit. So I'm really excited about what you guys are doing, your podcast, your expertise, and that we're just, we're starting to speak up more and just kind of share our point of view with the world and contribute to making it a more positive place. All right. Well, I know we found you on LinkedIn, but if you want to give a shout out to where else everybody can find more information on your company and what in the great work that you're doing, feel free to let them know where to go. Yeah, you can check out OsoVR at OsoVR.com, O-S-S-O-V-R. Definitely follow me on LinkedIn, Justin Barad. If you're interested, you can follow me on Twitter as well at JB Hungry for mostly Oso related and some food related content. <laughs> that's that you picked the right Twitter handle then to combine uh, also <laughs> VR and food. That's excellent. That was Dr. Justin Barad, orthopedic surgeon and founder, CEO of Oso VR. And he said it so succinctly, Melanie, that I'm kind of painting a picture of the future. And I think for many of the new residents and surgeons that are coming along and coming up, they're expecting to see technology. We've done interviews about robotics. We've done, you know, interviews about the future of telemedicine and, you know, robotics is here. Telemedicine, you know, it seems like it's like, you know, as soon as there's 5G, maybe it's coming right around the corner. But he did a nice job of talking about how VR is here today. The technology, even just at the general consumer level, is already ready to support, you know, this kind of technology. And they're doing it. They're doing it. And so I, I, I've definitely used some VR headsets. I don't own one myself. But I, a few times, like I put one on maybe a few years ago, and he said that the scale of this is really improving dramatically. And I think... You said you just bought one of these headsets. So I'm kind of thinking you're going to come on a future episode and say, hey, I just got my new VR headset. <laughs> it's like the real world. You know, Justin wasn't kidding. No, he's not kidding. And I've played on one before, and it's actually one of the reasons I bought it. But I mean, Beat Saber is not exactly the same as learning how to do surgery, although that's a pretty fun game. <laughs> but to think that you can take this technology that kids are using, or heck, I'm an adult and I'm using it to do for entertainment and then apply it to something so life-changing as surgery and to learn and to maybe cut down on some of that carrying your notes into the OR or pulling something up on Google because you can get that muscle memory and that repetition in that you need so you can see do cases more often. I just think it's fascinating the ways that technology is bringing expertise and improving it in the world of medicine. So there are, you know, so many people that are expecting to see this technology, but I think what is really interesting is you've seen a big movement towards gamification and that it makes learning fun and engaging and then taking that pressure, you know, off of, you know, having that patient right there as you're still kind of gaining that competency. I mean, I can see where this is just 
you know, such a huge improvement for um, confidence building before you go and even work on the cadaver and then eventually are actually doing procedures on your own. So, so definitely check them out on LinkedIn and continue to watch their progress. That's going to do it for this week's show. As a reminder, you can help support First Case by subscribing on Apple, Amazon, or Google Podcasts. You can also find us on Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or your favorite podcast application. We've got bonus content for certain episodes. Just got to download our smartphone app for iPhone and Android. And while you're there, we'd certainly appreciate a rating and review because your feedback is important to the show. And on behalf of Melanie Paul and myself, thank you for listening to this week's episode of First Case. First Case.